100,000. So they only drilled 6,000. They've only fracked 2,500 of them. How far into the play are they? So what would you learn by going to Pennsylvania and looking right now? Not much. My type. No. All right, what are the environmental impacts? I'm going to quickly go through a couple of other slides to indicate what some of them are, and then I'm going to focus on the one that I'm going to talk about tonight, which is impact on methane emissions, greenhouse gases, and climate change. So as you can imagine, if you're living in that, um, that mansion to which you retired on your 40 acres, and suddenly this occurred in your backyard, you've got uh, a flare that's running for a couple days or maybe a couple weeks. Anybody ever heard of around a flare? What do you know about? <coughs> Burning off methane gas. Are they noisy? Uh, depends on the okay. uh, Are they bright at night? Yeah. Okay. Um, so there's a lot of activity going on here, and again, this is a multi-well pad, so this isn't going to be done in two weeks. It's going to take two years to get completely developed into production. Uh, it's possible to put these pads anywhere, depending upon state regulations. Again, with no federal regulations controlling this. Uh, a state or a municipality can provide the lease its land. In this case, this particular area is a lease lease one of our county parks for development. I've often heard it said that we have to get rid of coal because it removes mountaintops, and I agree completely. But in Pennsylvania, they're also removing mountaintops for shale gas development. Sometimes they have to remove the mountaintop, sometimes they have to build the mountain. So can you imagine how much earth they have to move here to create that pad to start going on? And sometimes they do have to remove a lot of earth. So the point here is they can drill anywhere nowadays. With the earth moving equipment and the ability to drill down and laterally, the whole idea is to put your clustered pads everywhere you possibly can to get them developed. Okay. So we could talk about <coughs> local air pollution effects. We could talk about local water pollution effects. People's private well waters can be affected. We can talk about regional waste disposal, air, uh, solid liquids and gases. But I want to focus for the rest of my talk before we come back to the question of what you would do um, on what happens when methane CH4 is produced from shale gas wells. So shale gas is a fossil fuel. You burn it, you get carbon dioxide. You get a lot less carbon dioxide per unit of energy than you get by burning coal or oil. So from the point of view of carbon dioxide emissions, it is absolutely true that burning natural gas is a cleaner fossil fuel. I didn't say clean, I said cleaner. From the point of view of carbon dioxide emitted on burning, it's cleaner than gas, cleaner than coal, cleaner than oil. But it is a non-renewable fossil fuel, and since it does emit carbon dioxide when it's burned, it's not helping our carbon dioxide problem. The other problem that most people haven't looked at, in fact, nobody had looked at in the peer-reviewed literature until about a year and a half ago, is the question, what happens when you take into account not only the carbon dioxide you get by burning natural gas from shale formations, but what happens when you take into account the other greenhouse gas that is produced and potentially vented into the atmosphere by the production of shale gas. Because if you want to answer the question, is shale gas a clean fossil fuel, you have to address both greenhouse gases, not just the carbon dioxide. So what we know is that there is methane either purposely vented or leaked during most of the entire process. So during the frack fluid blowback period, you inject large amounts of fluid at high pressure into the shale and frack it. Much of that fluid comes back up. What comes back up with it is methane. Sometimes that methane is vented, sometimes it's not vented, sometimes it's flared. Eventually it's captured to market. Uh, routinely and continuously at the well site, during the drilling process, especially in the Devonian shales, there are multiple layers of shale containing gas on the way down to the Marcellus. During the drilling process, every time that drill goes through a gas-bearing shale, there's a burp. That gas comes up the well. It can't be captured. It can't go to market. There's no pipeline. You're in the drilling phase. That gas is vented. 
during liquid unloading, during gas processing, and most importantly, perhaps, during the transmission of the gas from the wellhead to a place where it's compressed, to a place where it's dehumidified, and to a place where it's processed, that's by gathering line, and then eventually after the compressor station into a transmission line, and eventually after it gets to a place like Ithaca, or New York City, or Boston, it goes into distribution lines. And we have millions of miles of transmission and distribution pipelines in the US. And not very many of those miles are young. So there's leakage. So I'm going to give you some examples of leakage. I'll give you an example of what leakage looks like during flowback. So this is a pad undergoing flowback. The material was injected into the shale to fracture it, refracture it. It's coming back up. It's not being flared. It's not being sent to market. It's being vented. To give you an idea of scale, I'm going to show you a video. And remember this machine. So right now, with the naked eye and with usual photography, what you see here is water vapor. You can see that with the naked eye. I'm next going to show you a video which is done using clear, forward-looking infrared radar, which can be tuned to show other materials in false color. So what you're going to see on this video is anything that's yellow is a hydrocarbon, most likely methane. So the well is slowing back. They can't get a flare lit because the well is slowing back to such a high pressure and high volume that you can't get a flare lit. There's no reduced emission completion or green completion equipment available uh, to take this to market. So it's vented. I'll go this, I'll just go a couple more seconds and you'll see that piece of equipment come back in and you get the idea of the scale of what's happening here. Okay, so that's an example of methane emissions, purposeful, not accidental, purposeful, uh, during the period of flow bed. <clears throat> Here's another source of venting. Again, this is going to be a video. This is the production casing. This is the well head. The well has been drilled. It's been multiply cased, multiply cemented. It's been fracked. And this well is in production. A good well produces gas only up through the production casing. That's why it's called a production casing. It produces the gas. A bad well is a well that has lost zonal isolation, aka lost structural integrity, aka it leaks. All terminology, different terminology means the same thing. So I'm going to show you what it looks like when a well is leaking near the wellhead. And the telltale here, and this is an important telltale, is that in this case, the so-called cellar, C-E-L-L-A-R, not S-E-L-L-E-R. The cellar is, in, is a volume of earth that's been excavated around the wellhead. And if that cellar gets full of water because of rain or snow melt, then what you have is an ability to actually visualize leakage. And here, that's a leaking well. Two possibilities here. That's methane and perhaps other hydrocarbon gases. It's certainly being vented into the atmosphere. There's a possibility, depending upon where that leak is, that on the way to the surface, it has to go through an aquifer. And if it does, there's a possibility that that aquifer is going to be contaminated with methane that was not there before the well was drilled. discussion today with uh, Andrew Rudkin, who wanted to know, as did a lot of other people in the room, well, how often does this happen? And uh, how can you tell when it happens? And the answer to both of those questions, the answer to the first question is, if you really don't know, I can give you a lower bound. Um, so let me give you an example. So if, a, if an inspector goes to a well and sees what you just saw, which is called bubbling in the cellar, that's proof positive that the well is leaking, no question. How about the inverse? If a person goes to a well, an inspector, and does not see bubbling in the cellar, is that proof that the well is not leaking? Is there water there? Well, even if there's water there. I mean, they can go with a sniffer. You know what a sniffer is. Where's your cigarette in there? No, you don't put a cigarette in there. 
But if, he, if there's no evidence of leaking at the well here, does that prove positive the well isn't leaking? The answer is no. So I'll give you an example of that. Uh, Little Muncie Creek, Lycoming County, Pennsylvania. Uh, a couple of fishermen were walking up the creek one day and started seeing something they'd never seen before. Yes, there is natural bubbling in some streams. This stream was not bubbling, and you can go to the Pennsylvania DEP website and confirm that for yourself. There are a number of locations in the Susquehanna River and streams and rivers around Pennsylvania that were not showing this, that are showing it. Mm -hmm. The nearest gas well was 2,200 feet away. And that gas well was never issued a violation for leakage until this occurred, and they did isotopic analysis and determined that that gas was in fact coming from that well, 2,200 feet away. How did it get there? The How did the gas get from the well to there without coming up to the aquifer? The aquifer? The aquifer? Right. It's underground geology. It goes wherever it wants. Okay. Let's go all the way downstream. Where else does gas leak? <coughs> I mentioned that there are millions of miles of transmission and distribution pipeline in the U.S., not many miles of which are very young. In some places, like downtown Boston, cast iron gas mains, turn of the century, not 1900 to 2000, talking 1899 to 1900, cast iron gas mains with bell and spigot joints full of hemp. No, not this kind. Okay. So uh, there is technology now that you can put in a car or in an airplane, you can do over flights, and you can measure the background level of methane in the atmosphere, that's this, roughly two parts per million. That's natural background level on the globe right now. And your high-class high, uh, high great science sniffer can show you spikes. So all these are spikes above background. So this is background, spikes, background, spikes. Some of those spikes are 50 to 100 times higher than background. <coughs> so that's proof that there are the gas lines underneath Boston. It'd be nice to know what the cumulative effect is of all the leaking pipelines distribution, all the leaking pipelines transmission, all the venting during flowback, all the failed wells, it would be nice to know how much methane we're actually putting into the atmosphere. Do we know? The answer is no. We don't know that answer well. It's research that needs to be done. <coughs> but whatever it is, it's not supposed to be there because methane is a very potent greenhouse gas. It exacerbates climate change. It makes things worse than we already thought they were with just carbon dioxide. So again, some data. NOAA data, five years of measurement of carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere. You all know this one. Here's the cyclic variation. Here's the trend by year. We're up to about 394 parts per million. Those of you who do believe we're experiencing global warming and do believe that it is at least in part anthropogenic have probably read that uh, if we ever get to 450 parts per million, that would indicate a average temperature change on the Earth that would make life thereafter a little bit more difficult than today. And that's an understatement. So 450 has been targeted as a, the tipping point amount. We're currently at uh, 394, we're at 391 last December. It's going up, the slope of that curve is two parts per million per year. You don't want to get to 450, we're currently at 390, that's 60 years, 60 parts, two parts per year, it's 30 years. We don't do anything different about carbon dioxide increase. we got 30 years until we get to tipping point. We don't have 100 years. Data that most people don't know, again, historical data, methane concentration in the atmosphere, historical record more or less flat from 1,000 to about 1750. <coughs> Industrial Revolution comes along, agriculture grows, all kinds of new sources of methane get emitted into the atmosphere. Not just from oil and gas production, lots of sources. And you can see methane concentration is going up to about two parts per million. So what? Methane is a much more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. Molecule for molecule depending upon how long you're willing to do the very complex atmospheric chemistry to 
which has to be done by supercomputer, to figure out what the relative warming potential is of methane compared to carbon dioxide, you have to decide how long you want to wait. Because there are different residence times between of carbon dioxide and methane in the atmosphere. The current science, <coughs> as published in Science Magazine three years ago, says that if you wait, if you do that integration, of a comparison of methane to carbon dioxide over 100 years, methane is 33 times more potent than carbon dioxide. Well, on the other hand, you wouldn't do that integral over 20 years, it's 105 times more potent. In either case, what that says is a relatively small amount of methane has the same warming potential as a large amount of carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we have to be careful about methane. So, a year and a half ago, more or less, Bob Howard and Renee Santoro and I published a paper, a uh, peer-reviewed journal paper, um, in which we asked the question and tried to answer, is shale gas a clean fossil fuel? So I'll interpret this graph from the paper. Comparing shale gas, conventional gas, to coal and diesel for their effect on climate change, that's this vertical axis, by way of direct CO2 emissions, indirect CO2 emissions, you got to burn diesel to run the bulldozers, run the drilling machinery, run the fracking equipment, make the cement, make the steel. That all takes, all produces CO2 as an industrial process. And by the way, I forgot to tell you, every shale gas well that we put in the ground right now entombs 100 tons of steel. It's 100 tons of steel, it's entombed. You don't get it out when you're done. Uh, 100 tons of steel a lot. You get 50,000 wells in New York State, 100,000 wells in Pennsylvania, 70,000 wells in Ohio, 100,000 times 100 tons. Uh, 100 tons of steel times 20,000 wells is the equivalent of the total tonnage of the United States Navy. So it takes a lot of energy to make that steel, and that turns out to be this blue part. So it's significant, and that's a lot of steel, and it's not recyclable. It's lost forever. So this is the carbon dioxide emitted by burning, and as you can see, when you burn natural gas, you get a lot less carbon dioxide than you do by burning coal or oil. That's the dark part. The blue part, more or less the same, turns out. The pink is the stuff we're worried about. And like all good scientists, since we don't have the science nailed, this was the very first paper addressing this question, and the first thing we found is that there was a dearth of data. So we made a lot of estimates with a lot of assumptions, and said so in our paper. And we said, well, we think the right answer is somewhere between this value and this value. And of course, everybody who reacted negatively to our paper ignored the fact that we gave a range and just picked the biggest value and said we were exaggerating. We weren't exaggerating here, we trying to upper bound and lower bound is what engineers do. So we think that the right answer for the impact, total impact of carbon dioxide and methane from shale gas development is somewhere between that number and that number. For conventional gas, somewhere between that number and that number. Depending upon whether you're surface mining or deep mining coal, that number and that number. So I'll put some horizontal lines on here for your benefit. Forget about the upper bound estimate. Forget we ever said it. I wish we had ever said it. Because uh, people, a person reads what they want to read and disregards the rest. Paul Simon, 1972. <laughs> so forget that. I'm sorry we ever put it in the paper. Just look at this one. Which, by the, and by the way, since our paper, there have been 10 referee journal publications on this same topic. They're coming out at the rate of about one every two or three weeks. And what people are finding is that, yeah, this number is probably way out of bounds. This number is pretty reasonable. And what this says is that if you take into account both methane and CO2, shale gas is dirtier than coal and dirtier than diesel. It's not a clean fossil fuel. It calls into question whether you want to be producing a lot of shale gas now, shale gas now, with the objective of decreasing the impact on climate change. All right, next to last graph, and probably the most important one I'm going to show you, and it's not ours, 
It came out of a paper in Science Magazine by Drew Shindell, who is a NASA scientist, along with about 10 other scientists from around the world. I'll take my time explaining it to you. Horizontal axis is year, 1900, 2000. Here we are, 2012. Here's that 2050 period when you're supposed to make your decision as to how we want things to be. The vertical axis is the change in the average Earth temperature relative to a baseline, the delta. And the IPCC has agreed that the baseline is the average Earth temperature between 1890 and 1910. So that's zero. The squiggly line are measurements made around the world by thousands of thermometers. So the squiggly line is actual measurements. And as you can see, in 2010, we had warmed the Earth by about 9 tenths degrees centigrade. I've got to explain the rest of this for you. Yellow starts at 1.5 degrees centigrade, stops at 2. That's the warning zone. That's like the yellow blinking light. That 450 parts per million of carbon dioxide is more or less equivalent to that number. Don't want to get there. This is your warning. You don't want to get up here. Bad things happen, all kinds of feedbacks that we've been talking about. Now, there are four curves here. Remember, this is measured data. These are computer simulation results. Each one of these is the result of putting different data into a climate change model run on the world's biggest, fastest computers by the world's smartest climate change scientists. The current error bars are shown here. So if we're looking at this purple curve, the computer model gave it its maximum Monte Carlo simulation up here, minimum here. So I want to explain what each of these curves is. Purple curve is called reference. By reference, it's business as usual. No major changes worldwide. This isn't US now, this is international. No major changes that would result in the current trends in the production of carbon dioxide, methane, and black carbon. DC stands for black carbon, also known as soot. No major change. Business as usual. China can keep doing what it's doing, India can keep doing what it's doing, the US can keep doing what it's doing. And this says that by the year 2042, we're in deep doo doo. Or maybe not. No, well. And it keeps on going because the carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere for a century, and that thing stays in the atmosphere for a decade, whatever. That's bad. 2042. Um, if we decide only today to start doing something about carbon dioxide, you get the red curve. And as you can see, by starting today to enact policies and procedures worldwide to substantially reduce carbon dioxide emission into the atmosphere, including a decrease in burning of all fossil fuels, because that's where the carbon dioxide is largely coming from, then you delay getting into the red zone until about the year 2050. But you do get into the red zone. And you stay in the red zone until about the year 2090, and then you come back out. But there might not be any 2090, depending on how bad things get up in this zone. What is that again? Right here. What is it? Uh, make, do measures to reduce carbon dioxide, ignore methane, ignore black carbon. <coughs> this dark blue curve says if we start this is 2010, not today. We've already lost two years. <coughs> if we had started in 2010 to drastically reduce methane emissions and black carbon emissions, the computer models say that we're on the blue curve. And we delay getting into the red zone until the year 2060, but again, we get back into the red zone because by then, all the methane that went into the atmosphere would have gone and we're back down, back to the same slope as the carbon dioxide curve. These two curves have to have the same terminal slope. And they do. It's one way of verifying the computer model that way. So what should we do? If you're going to spend a buck today. Doesn't do you any good to start, doesn't do you as much good to start decreasing carbon dioxide because the carbon dioxide that's harming us now was put up there 70, 80, 90, 100 years ago. It was put there 10 years ago, it's going to be there for another 90 years. 
But the methane we put up there today is much more potent as a greenhouse gas over the next 10 years. Over the next 20 years, it's still over 100 times more potent. So if we enact measures that decrease methane and black carbon, we delay bad stuff. The obvious solution here, if you believe any of this, I happen to believe it, especially the error bars, is to drastically decrease the production and use of all fossil fuels. And black carbon producing things, like burning gum in India. That puts us on the light blue curve and it says, uh, well, we get into the yellow zone in about 2042, we never get to the red zone. If, this, if the average computer model is right. If the upper bound is right, we still get into the red zone, but we come down out of it sooner. So that's science, it's not necessarily the truth. It's one paper, uh, it's supposedly the best climate scientists who are going to be a major part of the next IPCC report using the best available climate science modeling and computers to try to predict your future. My take on this is we better do something about methane real quick. And I think I told you where a lot of the methane is coming from and where a lot more is going to come from if we continue on the shale gas business. So come back to uh, the question I asked you early on. What's your strategy? Here's where we are. Where do you want to be? How much energy do we want to be using in the United States? We're currently using 98 to 100 quads, but I already showed you that our per capita efficiency keeps going up. We're getting better and better at efficient use of energy and conserving more. So let's look at the problem from a constrained optimization point of view. This is a big constrained optimization problem. I don't care where you go to work. Uh, in your lifetime, if you get involved in this problem, you're involved in the biggest constrained optimization problem, in my opinion, that humankind has ever seen, pardon my purple. All right. You can state your optimization objective any way you want, so I'm picking you. Don't argue with me. It could be anything you want. I'm just picking one to get you started on your thought process. I say we should continue to meet national energy demand up to 90 quads through 2050. You might say, well, if we're currently using 98, why do we have to go down to 90 in 2050? Can't we go up to 110? Or can't we do better on conservation and efficiency and go down to 80? Sure, you, you set your objective. And now what are the constraints? I've listed just some of them. For me, the most important constraint is whatever we do, whatever decision-making process we start on today, and that you affect by your professional development, we have to decrease the use of fossil fuels. Otherwise, we're not going to slow global warming. Constraint. Maintain our standard of living. What's that mean? Well, in the U.S., private vehicle use, homes heated just the way we want them, keep on going to describe the American standard of living and how it is impacted by energy consumption. I don't think anybody wants to argue that we want to become a poorer nation, a nation where it's more difficult to live. We want to at least maintain our current state of, standard of living. Increase energy security and independence, two different things. Uh, we want to decrease imports. We want to lead energy geopolitics. We don't want to be followers, we want to be leaders. You know, energy, ge energy geopolitics in the past have involved this in wars. Perhaps we don't want to get in more wars. Maybe you do, it's up to you. We have to respect the other rights of other nations to continue to advance their standard of living. We're high on the hog, remember? We're little piggies, but we're still big piggies. We can't tell the other nations you can't get where we are now because you're spoiling it for us. To a large extent, we've been spoiling it for them. <clears throat> Meet economic and sociological realities. We can't continue to have energy costs continue to rise, just like we can't continue to have health care costs continue to rise. I guarantee you, by supply and demand, I'm not, an I'm not an economics expert, but I know something about supply and demand. As supply goes down and demand goes up, price goes up. So the cost of fossil fuels will continue to rise. Who controls the price of the sunlight? Who, 
controls the price of wind. Rhetorical questions. Uh, people are slow to change. We have this imperative brought on, brought on by this first constraint. We better hurry up and slow or reverse climate change so that people are slow to change. That's a sociological issue. And you can start seeing contradictions among these things. If you say, well, let's drastically decrease the use of fossil fuels as soon as we can, that probably means quickly decreasing our standard of living until we bring other sources of energy online. You can't get all of those happening simultaneously and all of them optimized. You gotta make trade-offs. That's what energy users do. So what's your solution strategy? Where do you want to go? I'm done. I'm done, I'm done except that I now want to engender discussion among the students. Where do you want to go? Tell me where to draw those lines to. Who's first? Well, our great use of uh, hydroelectric and more renewable resources that aren't going to hurt us. We need hydroelectric more. <coughs> yeah, you want to increase hydro. To increase hydro, increase hydro you need water. Yeah. But we're going to Okay, but where are you going to get it? How many dams are there? In the, actually, is the U.S. building more dams or deconstructing more dams per year now? We're actually deconstructing more than we are building. We work about as much hydro as we can. We can get micro hydro. We can import a lot more hydro from that. <coughs> and you said increase um, renewable resources. How quickly do you think we could do that? Other comments? Where, where do you want these other things to go? Given these constraints, where do you want the other ones to go? Please. efficiency and conservation so that in the future we need significant less than 98 watts, then the sum total of all these goes down. It's implied. Good point. How much does it cost to be more efficient and conserved? <laughs> I can see a CU. <laughs> Chris isn't going to like this. Uh, so those are, that's low-hanging fruit, right? Conservation is the lowest hanging fruit. Just don't use as much energy. Efficiency is the next slowest hanging fruit. Change out your incandescent bulbs for LEDs, that's efficiency. Turn off the LEDs, that's conservation. Um, it's nice to know that our cars by fleet average are going to have much higher mileage 15 years from now than they have today. Insulate your home, insulate the windows. What else? What do you want to what, should we go back and start? Using high volume hydraulic fracturing and a lot more oil wells in the U.S. What do you think? Um, is there any reason that the U.S. is not relying on nuclear energy as much as the other forms of energy, other than the fear of riding out the energy? It's a good question. I'd like to have people's opinion. What should we do with this? There was a time when I was your age, talking about kids here, <laughs> that this was a dream. When I was your age, that was going to be this. We were going to go, see that curve right there? We'd all be driving electric cars. We still might be driving electric cars, except back then we were thinking we'd be driving electric cars with electricity coming from nuclear. You're going to put a nuclear plant up here at the station. Well, you should have an opinion. Most of you are going to be engineers, right? Some of you are electricals, mechanicals. So there's a question. What do you do with that? How fast can you get the blue curve to go up? What do we do with nuclear? What do we do with coal? The dirtiest of fossil fuels. I don't think anybody objects to that except the people putting the clean coal commercials on TV. <laughs> and both the Republicans and Democrats. What do you think we should do with coal over the next 50 years? Hey, your problem, not mine. I'm going to be dead by then. <laughs> or at least be on oxygen. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm not going to care much about what's in the atmosphere. I'm going to be in an oxygen tent. Yeah. Um, so in general, I think fossil fuels should be reduced. I don't think anyone really objects to that. Okay. Well, but the question is, how do we how do we get those down? Get those down. While at the same time supplying enough energy so that we don't reduce our standard of living, while at the same time not upsetting the geopolitical apple cart. And while at the same time making sure that prices remain reasonable for everything else. Mm. Make other things go up. You have to make other things go up in order to make things go down. So I think one line you don't have here is alternative energy sources that don't yet exist. Things like fusion and the eater program. It's a huge economical issue. Isn't that why you walk into Cornell? Right? You're going to invent those things? You're going to develop cold fusion. Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah, I'm very, very hopeful that somebody, somebody bright student in Cornell or someplace else, develops something sometime about here that can have a substantial impact on this that doesn't show here right now. It's what I encourage. When I teach my course at Cornell for the last five or six years, I haven't been encouraging, even though I, my PhD was in Rockland campus. I spent 20 years doing research in hydraulic fracturing, well drilling, cementing, perforating, pipeline safety. When I talk to my students in my courses, I don't advise them to go into the oil and gas industry. I advise them to be young, inventive entrepreneurs. So it's another curve there. standard of living than the people in Germany? Who uses more energy per capita? We have a lower standard of living than the people in France? Switzerland? We travel for the neighbor. So there are aspects of our standard of living that are different. But what are you going to give up in one aspect of standard of living that's substituted for in another aspect of the standard of living, so that overall the standard of living would be the same. You don't have to make sure everything stays the same. You can give up other things because if in consequence you get something else back that you don't have now. Like peace of mind. Public transportation. Public transportation is an example of something you can do instead of driving your car. Missouri, nobody drove a car. Is it perfect? Can't be it's called a transit. Last time I was in Delta. <laughs> can't. Can't place the car. It's car. On the other hand, the last time I was in China, everybody was on a bike. That was 20 years ago. And now everybody in China is in a car. We, uh, we can't control, to a large degree, we can't control what the other major company, countries that are large consumers of energy are equipped. We could give examples. We could continue. Here, excuse me, I am going to be political. On the very same week, about two months ago, the United States State Department held international conferences in a couple of countries around the world to help those countries understand how we can export shale gas development technology. And in the same week, Hillary Clinton announced a new five nation agreement to drastically decrease methane emissions. This is my example of why Washington doesn't work. <laughs> I don't know. I don't understand how you can do both. But the point I'm making here is we can we can't control what China does or India does or Brazil does, but we can influence. I, I just want to say we're not students. Hold on. Can we get the students done? If we have enough time, we'll go to the the peanut gallery. Our most concern is greenhouse gas and the climate change. Is there any Available for CO2 and, um, in the ground. Okay, excellent question. What can we do technologically to continue to use, hopefully at a decreasing rate, fossil fuels while at the same time decreasing their impact on climate change by reducing the amount of carbon dioxide that eventually gets into the atmosphere and the amount of methane that gets into the atmosphere? So carbon sequestration is something that comes to mind. Is it technologically feasible? Is it economically feasible? 
um, methane emissions, there are lots of technologies that are currently available that the industry could have been using. They've been doing shale gas development in Texas since 1990. They could have been using an array of technologies to substantially reduce methane emissions. But it's not economically viable? And, well, it depends upon how much profit you want to make. You can tell, if we were just having this discussion with Andrew Revkin this afternoon, if you show a company that they can save 5% of their total cost on a well by using a reduced emission completion unit, most companies won't do that because they expect to spend money at a 20 to 25% rate of return. Okay, so am I, am I, please tell me I'm successful in stimulating your thinking. Good. I don't have any of the answers, I just have a, I think, an interesting way of asking the questions and sort of influencing your answers. Yeah. Uh, looking at that, that graph a couple of slides back, uh, with the air bars on it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It it looks it looks like it's pretty you know overwhelmingly likely that we're going to hit 450 at at some point, mm -hmm. uh, regardless of what we do. So wouldn't we be better off looking at you know rather than the the 450 timeline more on, on a long scale and saying we should cut down on carbon dioxide uh, versus methane, you know, because that's going to be around for 100 years, you know, regardless of the methane issue. Yeah. That's the argument that other climate scientists are making. They look at that curve and draw an entirely different conclusion. I look at that, and I, I want to be on the blue curve. <clears throat> so should we also be thinking in the plan B, if we get to that level, what we can do yeah. as well? Because there's like a we're going to reach yeah. that point. I mean, you, so for example, talk about plan B. For example, those those curves, the ones that say that you cut the emissions of uh, carbon dioxide and methane, it means like zero from or reducing. Which well, at what rate of reduce? Well, I have to go back and read the papers. They're not cutting to zero. They're, these are all based on Monte Carlo simulations, where obviously on this light blue curve, this one would be we hardly do anything compared to what we could do. While we're still doing something down here, we're saying, man, we need to <coughs> tighten things up. So you have to read the paper to answer your question about what's causing the variability in these things. And remember, these are computer simulations. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't the problem with these, the problem with these computer simulations, let's see, who was it? The famous physicist who said it's it's very difficult to make a prediction, especially about the future. <laughs> okay. The problem here is that when I do computer simulations of cracking in aircraft wings, I tell the Navy or the Air Force when or when not to fly an airplane, I can validate my computer model because I can go to the Air Force base at right back and they can put a wing, a whole wing of an airplane into a testing rig and shake the hell out of it for two years and either validate or invalidate my computer model. The problem with these predictions is if we wait then to validate them, so that's bad news. The good news is that these predictions were made two years ago. That's good news and bad news. So the good news is that Schindel is going to write this paper, publish this paper soon. Uh, the prediction on the purple is day on. If we show two two years ahead is right on. It's been accurate. That's the good news. The bad news is we just lost two years. So everything's been shifted. We didn't start doing anything in 2010. <coughs> Change in the idea of the atmosphere. It's part of this. These are very complex. So if you haven't, if none of you have ever read a solid paper on how difficult it is to do climate change predictions, pick one. But pick the pick one done in published in a reputable journal by a reputable scientist. You can read this one or a bunch of others, and you'll see how darn difficult these calculations are. And yet they're really important. How much time do we have? So anybody want to see my predictions? Yeah. Don't laugh. Promise not to laugh? 
2050, 80 quads. 20% decrease in energy demand in the U.S. Can we do it? Uh, small scale hydro, importing hydro from Canada. Increased biomass to a small degree. More nuclear. Don't shoot me. No coal. Drastic decrease in fossil fuels. Right? I'm, my most important constraint in my optimization is climate change. So I drastically decrease all the fossil fuels. How do I get to 80? Let's see, I got uh, 12, 12 is 24, um, 15 is 39, 5 is 34, 4 is 38, 14. That door's not the lap. That's one of an infinite number of solutions. You get the pick. You get the design, participate in the design and execution of the solution. And remember, your solution in the U.S. isn't the only one you have to be concerned about. You have to have geopolitical impact, geopolitical leadership. That's one of the constraints. We can solve, we can do this in the U.S., and that does not necessarily mean that we solve the problem of climate change. Yes? Two I'm more not, questions. And I'm not a student, but I have a quick comment. I mean, in my optimistic opinion, when you talk about people are slow to change, I believe that we're in the midst of this revolution in people's ability to change their consciousness, especially with social media. People are now um, consuming information at a rate that they weren't consuming in the past. Um, and I see myself changing and having being armed with more information that's inspiring me to change my standard of living. Um, and I think that that is happening in the United States, especially, where people are seeing the way that people are living in Europe, for example, and realizing that there's actually a higher standard of living than maybe having an extra car or whatever it is that people may think they need. I agree with you, and I think that when this whole thing happens, it's not going to be with a bang, it's going to be with a limper. I believe in gradualism. For every black oak wind farm in Ithaca, there's going to be 50 more in New York State. For every one of us who's selling our big home and moving into a 1,200 square foot green off the grid home, there's going to be a million more like it over the next 10 years. And it's going to be, people are going to change. And they're going to like it. I'm going to like my small green home. I get to design it. I'm an engineer. I get to figure out how to design it, how to put all that energy and efficient stuff in it. Uh, one more question. Any students have questions before? Yeah. No. Uh, you know, the estimates of when uh, petroleum and coal and natural gas will reserves will be included? Uh, that's an excellent question. Uh, I am not a petroleum or gas or coal economist. I can point you to reputable fossil fuel economists, and one has to be very careful about whether we're talking about crude reserves or all the other terminology they use to talk about other forms of location of fossil fuels. The thing I know most about is shale gas, because I've been studying it intensely for the last four or five years. And the president's comment that we have a 100-year supply of shale gas, proven reserves, means using today's technology and reasonable prices that gas can be produced and consumed in the U.S. It's not 100 years. In my opinion, it's somewhere between 15 and 20. Which calls into question, do you want to rebuild the entire intercity and local natural gas pipeline network to reduce methane emissions? If you're only going to be using more methane, natural gas, for the next 20 years, where would bankers in New York or investment bankers in Zurich like to invest their cash? That's a rhetorical question. The question you asked is very good. Yeah. We got it quick. All right, thank, you. thank you so much.